When Jason Russell, an aspiring filmmaker, went to Uganda in 2006, he met a young boy named Jacob. Meeting him, he claims, changed his life. The young boy told him a horrifying story about the rebels in Uganda. We worried the rebels. When they raised us again, then they, they will kill us. He was scared for his life and had already lost his brother to the violence. The story moved Jason so much that he made the boy a promise. We are also gonna do everything that we can to stop them. Yes. Do you hear my words? Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Hmm? Yes. We are, we're going to stop them. In 2012, he decided to harness the new power of social media to try and keep that promise. One day, he and his organization, Invisible Children, released a 30-minute documentary detailing the horrors of the guerrilla leader, Joseph Kony, and the Lord Resistance Army, otherwise known as the LRA. Optimistically, they'd hoped a few thousand people would see it and maybe try to join in on the cause. But what happened next shocked the world and the organization alike. Joseph Kony. Joseph Kony. Kony campaign. Joseph Kony. Kony 2012. Kony 2012. Joseph Kony. Joseph Kony. Kony 2012. The video spread like wildfire, and the hashtag Kony 2012 was retweeted by the likes of Justin Bieber, Oprah Winfrey, and Kim Kardashian. Everyone who had likely never heard of the war criminal Joseph Kony before seeing the video was now screaming for the United States to get involved in the hunt to capture him. I think quite a, a lot of people, I don't think I know anybody that doesn't hate Joseph Kony. I've been to Uganda and, and, um, and Congo and been to the International Criminal Court myself and spoken with, um, uh, you know, with the chief prosecutor about the case and he's the one that we all wanna see in jail. Invisible Children, after harnessing the true strength of social media, decided to take it one step further, and they began a tour around middle-class, predominantly white schools to spread their message and, of course, sell their souvenirs. After watching the video, students had the opportunity to take $30 and spend it on an action kit containing a t-shirt, maybe a mug, and bracelets to support the cause. For just 30 bucks, they could feel like they were making a difference. This strategy proved so effective that Invisible Children was able to rake in millions of dollars. Surely, that would be enough to keep the promise, right? Well, not so fast. Soon, people would start to wonder, hey, where was all this money actually going? Were we really going to stop the criminal monster they had convinced us all was public enemy number one? And more importantly, did the United States even have the moral right to step into a situation like this? The backlash of Kony 2012 was swift and would spell near disaster for the organization and its founder who had been hospitalized from exhaustion. But the conversations that were started because of one 30 minute documentary are ones we are still grappling with today. What were the real issues between the viral call to action and are we still falling into the same mistakes of our past? Well, let's get into it. Hello and welcome to Dark Dives. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be talking about the broken aid to Africa phenomenon using the viral Kony 2012 movement as our main example. When Kony 2012 first went viral, some rejoiced. Meanwhile, others were quick to criticize the new viral sensation. For some, the criticism was solely focused on the organization. Invisible Children wasn't particularly well known before Kony 2012, and when they finally appeared on the radar to beg the world to go after Joseph Kony, many people were left questioning just what the organization was. And after some digging, people were not particularly impressed. In June, 2011, the organization earned roughly $13.8 million. And that's a lot of action kits sold to middle-class and wealthy children in schools, right? Surely that would be enough to donate to relief efforts. Well, not so fast. Instead, about $8.9 million of their revenue were used for salaries or to budget for the production of future films. I get the future film thing to an extent, for the record. Like, if they could make more of these films and have them go viral yet again, they would be able to raise more money or put more political pressure on countries to act. 
But at the same time, that is a wild amount of money to set aside in the hope that lightning strikes twice and that they can get that money back and then some. If they were really committed to this one singular cause, then you would think they'd spend more money focusing solely on that. Then again, even the money they did send to aid their mission seemed to be used in questionable manners. When they should have been putting money in the pockets of activists in the area and providing shelter for the children they were desperately trying to protect, they were doing no such thing. Some of their supposed work included airdropping leaflets from planes that encouraged LRA soldiers to lay down their arms. And I don't know why they thought leaflets would stop an extremely violent rebel army, but okay. They did do something else that was relatively helpful though. They provided radios to villages so they could report LRA activities. It's not much, but it is at least something. However, hearing that only 30% of their revenue was heading to their supposed mission was still quite jarring and definitely makes you think if those action packs were really worth the purchase. When more of your earnings go to the awareness program than actionable steps, people are bound to have some thoughts, none of which are probably super congratulatory towards your organization. While their financials certainly raised some of the loudest concerns, they certainly were not the only ones. People began to question the group's commitment to telling the full truth of the story when it came to the LRA and Coney. Some were quick to point out that the Coney 2012 documentary seemed to miss some vital information about the LRA and leaned heavily on the emotional aspect of the crisis more than actual facts. For the record, yes, the LRA had been responsible for some horrifying acts, including, and I quote, forcing children to shoot their relatives as part of the abduction to stigmatize them and keep them from wanting to escape. Now, the documentary was very clear about the horrors of the rebel army, but it missed a lot of details. It took almost the entire documentary for the filmmakers to mention that Kony and the LRA had actually already left Uganda. In fact, they had been actively forced out by the Ugandan military five years before the video came out. If the organization's whole goal is awareness, as they claimed, you would think they would spend a little more time focusing on where Joseph Kony and the LRA actually were. They also failed to mention that capturing Kony wouldn't actually end the atrocities that were happening. The LRA is an army. Simply catching one of the commanders wouldn't do much to end what was happening. Instead, a new commander would simply step up. So while this would be a symbolic victory, it wouldn't change much as far as the 30 minute documentary seemed to lead on. Kony wasn't the end all be all of situations. And I feel like if the producers had done just a little bit more research into what was going on, they would have realized that, or maybe they knew and were ignoring it. I don't know. The organization did have a tendency to oversimplify the complex conflicts they were attempting to address and overstate their influence on any changes that were occurring. While other organizations were releasing detailed, well-researched reports, Invisible Children was releasing films that were particularly targeting the sympathies of the younger generation. There was no complex analysis of what was going on and their so-called advocacy and education had quite a few holes in them. The Ugandan beneficiaries who often toured the United States with Invisible Children to share the video and attract donations harbored concerns that the group was being very, let's say, overly ambitious in their promises. One told the Washington Post, quote, "'In the Kony 2012 tour, "'I had to say that Kony was going to be arrested in 2012 "'and that he was going to be brought to justice "'in The Hague and so on. "'I had to say that, but I was very sure in my head "'that that was not going to happen. "'I really thought it was not going to happen. "'That was a big lie.' They have been looking for him for over 25 years. I felt very uncomfortable saying this. In reality, he was right. It had been over a decade since the Kony 2012 viral sensation and Kony is still free and wanted for war crimes. Throughout all the success paraded by the organization, the criticism started to take its toll. The leader was going through a downward spiral and people were starting to turn against their entire premise. While they may have failed in their overall mission, Kony 2012's failure did open a conversation in the United States and European countries. As it begged for intervention in the conflict in Africa, people began to discuss the implications of these issues. We've all seen the multiple organizations pushing for aid to Africa, or heard the unfortunate saying, there are starving children in Africa when refusing to eat our food. While this may seem helpful and beneficial at first glance, it's important to discuss, is the continuous aid to Africa helpful or is it actually more harmful? Let the world, let the international community take justice to him there, follow him wherever he is. First, to rescue our children. And secondly, to deliver, deliver the justice. We are determined. 
As we know, Invisible Children and Kony 2012 weren't exactly focused on sending specific aid to Africa to help defeat the LRA. But what they did want to do is pressure the United States to send aid. It's not a completely out of the blue request either. The richest countries in the world have been sending money to Africa for aid for decades. In fact, by 2014, economists estimate that roughly $135 billion had been sent to the continent. And in theory, that sounds wonderful, but in practice, it isn't quite as wonderful as everyone, I'm sure, would like to believe. While European countries seem to hold the belief that the continuous stream of aid to African countries would trigger growth in the economy, it might actually be doing the opposite. From the 1980s to the 1990s, when aid to Africa was at an all-time high, it was expected that African economies would be growing right along with the trend, right? But that's not what happened. Instead, they actually started doing worse than ever before. So why and how? Well, there are a couple of explanations, but there's one I really want to focus on and that is governmental power. According to Angus Deaton, a recipient of a Nobel Peace Prize, Aid to Africa shifts the power dynamics from the citizens to the governments. And just think about that for a moment. Governments collect taxes. They rely on those citizens to pay those taxes so they can continue to operate. This in turn gives citizens at least a sliver of leverage and political power. But if a shit ton of aid is flowing into these governments instead, the power dynamic shifts and severely. According to Deaton, this makes the government less accountable to its people and therefore less inclined to provide services that they have promised. As he says, it's very corrosive. It's safe to say that Kony 2012, as well as plenty of other organizations like them, probably didn't think of this particular dilemma. In the late 1990s, the World Bank reported that an astonishing 75% of African agricultural projects had been a complete failure, 75%. But let's look at a more well-known example. In South Africa, when the AIDS crisis was running rampant, the European Union donated over $2 million to develop a program for AIDS awareness. But much like Invisible Children and the Kony 2012 movement, the money wasn't quite used how people anticipated. Just as Invisible Children used their sudden influx of cash to send their employees on mission trips to Africa or pay for further development of different projects, the AIDS awareness campaign used most of their funds for a luxury bus for cast and crew while barely educating people about AIDS. To make that even worse, the program also contained inaccurate information. So even if they did spend some money on education, it was the wrong information. Rarely does any of the money donated to Africa go to the actual people who need it. Just like we saw with Kony, money wasn't going to the communities to get them out of a dangerous situation or to provide protection. Instead, it was going to pamphlets that were somehow going to convince people who carried out monstrous acts to stop what they were doing. When governments donate aid, it's not much different. Instead of it going to people, the aid goes to the government and they can do whatever the hell they want with it. So while people are convinced to donate their cash through the sad commercials with the quintessential starving African child trope, nothing is actually being done to fix that issue. Still, as Andrew M. Mwenda, who was named one of the top 100 global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine in 2009 pointed out, the commonly held solution to these issues is to just keep giving more. As he says, this approach is like saying, the patient is getting worse by this medicine and the solution is we should give them more of it. Even after Kony 2012 effectively won its mission to get the United States to spend roughly $1 billion to stop Kony and the LRA, nothing really came out of that. Same old story, just a different avenue. And even when this aid did eventually catch a confidant of Kony, Dominic Onwen, the so-called aid provided to the International Criminal Court to try him on an array of horrifying charges didn't seem to go to the right place. While citizens were asked to essentially risk their lives by testifying against this man, they were not given any type of reward for coming forward or protection for the risk they were taking on. A risk, which by the way, was testifying against a fucking war criminal. While $1 million was allocated for psychological rehabilitation programs, none was allocated to paying reparations for the victims of the war. Jason Russell first developed his organization as a promise to a young boy after learning about the atrocious and horrific acts of the LRA across Africa. We're going to stop them, he promised. But at the time, and some would argue to this very day, 
he didn't have a single clue as to how he was going to do that. He didn't have powerful connections or a financial structure that could send support to the kids who desperately needed the help. He didn't have any of that. Some call this naive. Others call it a symptom of the white savior complex. In simple terms, the white savior complex is when a white person from a position of superiority attempts to help or rescue a BIPOC person or community. Kony 2012 is a perfect example of this, as is the aid to Africa sent by European countries, just at a much larger scale. In essence, it's the idea that white people can solve a problem for a non-white community just because they are white. Jason Russell didn't have money secretly stashed away, connections that could fix the issue, or an in-depth understanding of what was truly happening as we've seen. He just thought he could help. No one asked for him to save them. He just figured he could because he could. As Savala Nolan, who was the director of the Felton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at UC Berkeley School of Law said, they think they are somehow in the position that should enable them to have more power in terms of solving the problem than the people who are impacted by the problem. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean people are doing this consciously, but that doesn't make it any less harmful. As we saw with Invisible Children, the organization was primarily organized by white Americans and funded by white Americans. Little help was taken from the people actually facing the issue and their understanding of the complex conflict was, well, lacking. Still, they pushed on collecting money and spending it in a manner that, objectively speaking, didn't really help anybody. While there is certainly some good in wanting to make a difference, those operating under a white saviorism lens seem to forget another rule of activism. First do no harm. But they're not the only ones who have done this. It happens all the damn time, unfortunately. Take the story of Renee Bach, for example. Back in 2008, then 18-year-old Renee went on a missionary trip to Uganda. I already have many issues with missionary trips and I've talked about it in a previous episode, and that's literally a whole other story for a different day. However, after this trip, Renee decided to make saving Africa her lifelong endeavor. She of course has no skills to do this. She didn't even have a high school diploma, but like Russell, she pushed on anyways. Soon, she developed a non-governmental organization called Serving His Children, which was meant to save babies in Africa. I have no idea how exactly she thought she would do this because her center was undoubtedly not a hospital and for a while didn't even employ a doctor. Despite this pretty obvious setback, over the span of five years, Bach and her organization ended up taking in roughly 940 children who were suffering from malnutrition. Over the years, at least some medical professionals were brought in to help, but they couldn't address the complexity of the health issues children brought into the center had. According to Jackie Kremlich, one of the American volunteers, these ranged from pneumonia, intestinal parasites, tuberculosis, many were in stage four HIV. You know, very serious illnesses that should be addressed by an actual doctor. But instead, Renee herself, who had no training at all, was rendering medical aid to these children. While the clinic was in operation, 105 children died in serving his children's care. Renee was, not surprisingly at all, sued by the parents as they fucking should. Bach completely ignored both international and Ugandan law, which required children with extra complications to be treated in an actual medical facility. The center didn't have any health licenses. In 2012 alone, the death rate in her center was 18%. Even after they hired two doctors in 2013, the death rate was still 10%. Better than before, but still high as hell for someone that supposedly was there to save all the children. Clearly, she was doing the opposite. By 2019, Bach settled a civil case with two mothers, but she never admitted any liability. She might have another chance soon though, because she is once again, rightfully, being sued. This lawsuit, which seems to be ongoing, has been brought on by four of the families impacted by the absolute incompetence of Renee and seeks her public apology and an acceptance of the responsibility for the violation of the right to appropriate healthcare and life of the children that she attended to. To be honest, taking responsibility for what happened would be the very least she could do, but that doesn't seem to be in the cards. Still, this whole drastically unfortunate situation is the epitome of white saviorism. She had no reason to believe that she could help these people. She never asked the people themselves, AKA the Ugandan doctors for help in her center. When the whole situation was over, she had the ability to actually return to Virginia as if nothing happened while the families impacted by her decisions were left broken in that country. Now, Coney 2012 didn't have quite the same impact. There is no documentation that the LRA conflict got any worse when the organization intervened, but there's also no confirmation that they helped the conflict get any better either. But there is one other concept, well, one more that I'm going to talk about. I am sure there are many more. 
that the makers of Kony 2012 might not have considered and that is still the overwhelming history and implications of increased militarization under the guise of help. And before we continue on to discuss this final topic, I'm just going to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2023, then why are you still paying insane amounts of money every month for your phone bill? Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save money this year. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just $15 a month. I've been using Mint Mobile for, I think it's over two years now at this point, something absolutely crazy. And I absolutely love the service. Their customer service has been a joy to talk to anytime I've had a problem. Paying my bill is easy. It's the same bill every single month. There's no surprises and my service is phenomenal. And all plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and switch easily in minutes with eSIM. So to get your new plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com slash dark dives. That's mintmobile.com slash dark dives. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark dives. Did you know that March is National Nutrition Month and HelloFresh is making it easy to choose delicious dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals under 700 calories with one third less sodium. HelloFresh makes mealtime easy with delicious recipes made with fresh, wholesome ingredients delivered to your door. There's no lines, no hassle, just great tasting meals that you can whip up and enjoy in the comfort of your home. And with the cost of groceries going up and up, now is the perfect time to get started with HelloFresh because HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. And HelloFresh knows you're busy. That's why they take care of the meal planning and prepping, freeing up that extra time in your schedule. With pre-portioned ingredients, foolproof recipes, and convenient doorstep delivery, HelloFresh makes it easier to get dinner on the table. So if you're ready to get cooking in the kitchen this year, make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash darkdive60 and use code darkdive60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash darkdive60 and use code darkdive60 for 60% off plus free shipping. In the long run, the biggest goal for Kony 2012 was to successfully pressure the United States government to send troops to Africa and stop Kony and the LRA. Theoretically, they actually did succeed in that goal. President Obama at the time had sought to address the situation with the LRA and had sent in about 100 troops that were to act as advisors to catch Joseph Kony. The troops went to Uganda, South Sudan, and the Congo. So yay, success, right? Well, maybe not necessarily. While I'm sure the creators of the film and those who pressured the military intervention had the best of intentions, it didn't seem like they considered the consequences. Something that seems to be a common theme throughout this entire situation, if we're being honest. There was always the concern of retaliation. If the United States became involved, there was a possibility that the LRA would strike back and commit even more atrocities throughout Africa. For example, when the Ugandan military was battling with them and attempting to catch Kony themselves, the group retaliated and killed hundreds of civilians in Congo. There was also the fact that many people within the LRA were actually children themselves. That was the whole point of the movement, wasn't it? Save the children. But what if the United States military trying to catch Kony had to interact with the child army? What if the children shot at the US soldiers first? Would they shoot back? These are all things that no one seemed to be considering at the time. That and the history of the United States going into conflicts and just making the situation worse. Unfortunately for us, the US does not have a wonderful history when it comes to helping other nations. In fact, the first full-scale invasion comes more than a century ago, the Mexican-American War. The war, which eventually led to the expansion of the country, was first sold to the people as a protection mission for Mexicans against, quote, powerful indigenous nations. Of course, we know now the real motivation was likely just more land and more power, but nonetheless, the first use of this protection and relief rhetoric would go on to be used repeatedly. A modern example of this might be how the United States named the military operation in Afghanistan, Operation Enduring Freedom, and touted it as a mission that would show the oppressed people of Afghanistan the generosity of America. It was a humanitarian war that was meant to aid people in an oppressed country. In reality, some experts believe that at least a partial reason for the incredibly drawn out war was due to the oil, gas, and as always, money. It wasn't necessarily a humanitarian crisis. 
In fact, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was caught sending a memo to his aides that asked them to come up with, quote, a plan for how we are going to deal with each of these warlords. Who is going to get money from whom, on what basis, in exchange for what, what is quid pro quo, etc. A study done in 2008 found that roughly 40% of the money that was donated to Afghanistan was earned back by the donor countries through corporate profits and consultant salaries. So you can see why countries might get a little weary when the red, white, and blue proudly proclaims that they're coming to help their citizens. As for how that strategy goes, this country doesn't have the most trustful track record. Kony 2012, I'm sure, started with the best of intentions, but unfortunately, they seem to have fallen into the same problems that multiple other people and even countries have fallen into in the past. Donating money is wonderful and attempting to help is commendable, but for it to be successful, people need to understand the full scope of the situation they are getting themselves into. Remember, do no harm is the first rule of activism. This means listening to the people you're trying to help, harnessing the skills that would be most helpful and backing off when people bring up concerns. We can all learn from Kony 2012 and hopefully in the future, do better. But with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of Dark Dives. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following and subscribing to stay up to date with all the latest episodes. I really appreciate you taking a chunk out of your day to hang out with me and listen to some new information. And as always, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.